Welcome to Thriller Vault, where thriller writers tell their favorite stories. I'm your host, Phil Williams, and I'm here with memoir and dystopian author Christopher Oldfield. Welcome to the show, Chris. I'm um, great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Chris is a budget adventurer, full-time writer, amateur prepper from Canada. After spending over a decade backpacking the world, Chris compiled his tales and misadventures into the hilarious memoir, The Dogs of Nam. While still an avid traveler and travel writer, these days his focus is on fiction. His debut novel, The Less Year, is a gritty and grim coming-of-age adventure and the first book of an action-packed trilogy. Chris is currently based on a small island in rural Sweden with his partner, rescue dog, blind cat, and newborn son. You can learn more and join his mailing list at ckoldfield.com. Without further ado, let's get into the story, Chris. All right. <clears throat> the story is called Blood Stains on the Banana Pancake Trail. In the summer of 2014, I packed my bags and moved to Sweden. Technically, I was still waiting for my residency permit so I couldn't stay long in the country. Hogtied by red tape, the bureaucrats informed me that I would wait up to 11 months for my paperwork to process. Not content to spend that time in cultural limbo, my Swedish partner and I decided to spend that time traveling instead. With our bags packed and tickets bought, we hopped on a plane to Asia for some adventures along what's known as the Banana Pancake Trail. Our bus broke down. It shouldn't have been a surprise considering its dilapidated exterior, the pockmarked roads, and the questionable sobriety of the drivers. Drivers, as in plural. For whatever reason, we seem to have been assigned a second driver for our trip, even though the duration of the journey was but a few hours. The two men were pushing the boundaries of middle age, as well as the outer limits of their belts. Like our ride, they had both seen better days. Wrinkled and gray, their tanned skin was a dark shade of bronze, oh so similar in color to the bottles of beer they dubiously sipped as we waited to board. Nursing their drinks under the ungainly whirl of a low-hanging ceiling fan, it seems they were committed to knocking back a few cold beers before we departed. Admittedly, some folks seemed to perform better with a bit of booze in their system, and as I climbed onto the bus, I held the hope that these gents were those kind of folks. Functioning alcoholics, with the emphasis on functioning. We were on our way north to Bangkok after soaking up the sun on the diver's paradise of Koh Tao and its boisterous neighbor Koh Samui. We diligently dodged the inebriated ridiculousness of the full moon party, indulging in a more low-key island life. Our fellow backpacking busmates, clad in the vibrant muscle shirts and airy elephant pants, were notably less diligent. Rows of sweaty twenty-somethings filled the seats around us. The conversations, a mingled mix of accents. Sunburnt skin in varying stages of lobster bright to half peeled and shedding was common. Aside from the drivers, I was the only guy in the bus not wearing a muscle shirt. A few lucky passengers also wore the backpacker badge of honor, bed bug bites. On the odd shoulder or exposed calf, I could trace the pestilent lines, unattractive remnants of an unlucky feast. Now, I'd survived over a year in Asia without so much as a single bite, but I knew I was the exception to the rule. My partner, her bad luck, a constant source of entertainment, was not so lucky. Bed bugs and sunburns were but par for the course in Southeast Asia. We had been on the road for the better part of three months. Our bodies acclimatized to the bumpy bus rides and low-budget lifestyle that forms the foundation of backpacking. Every day was a Saturday, an excuse to chill out, wander, stuff our faces, and generally just do whatever tickled our fancy. We were living the backpacker dream, basking in unchained freedom and privilege with only a few hiccups along the way to keep us in check. About an hour or two into our ride, the bus came to a rolling stop along a busy highway. We had, not surprisingly, broken down. With no air conditioning to keep us from boiling, everyone piled out. Keeping to the unpaved shoulder, the full moon crew mingled along the side of the highway, snapping duck face selfies for Instagram. It should go without saying that snarky complaints highlighted the entire process. 
Over the din of conversations, I heard the metallic hiss of a few beers cracking open. It must have been lunchtime. As for me, I tramped out in the brush away from prying eyes and relieved myself in the bushes. And after draining a pair of Changs, the budget-friendly logger in Thailand, with practice speed, the drivers held a brief conference. After some mumbled discussion, the two wheelmen nonchalantly decided that they could not only find the problem, but fix it, whatever it was. They grabbed a rusty toolbox from under the front seat, opened up the trunk, the engine was in the trunk, and began to examine their project. Now, I know nothing about engines, so I can't begin to fathom what was wrong, but from the looks of things, something just needed to be replaced or, or maybe tightened. At least that's what I gathered from their pointing and humming and hawing. That something, however, was located at the rear of the engine. It was, much to their sweaty chagrin, more or less unreachable. Someone would have to climb onto the steaming engine and crawl into the belly of the beast. The lucky mechanic would then need to hang themselves upside down, leaving their feet dangling out of the vehicle, and then they would have to locate the problem and go to work. Now, obviously, it would require someone nimble, thin. For whatever reason, the noticeably larger of the two men decided he would be the one to fix it. He grabbed a tool so rusty it stained his hands, sucked in his gut, tightened his belt, and slid up and over the engine, disappearing into the semi-dark of the cavernous bus trunk engine place. I stood around watching him as the rest of the young backpackers relived their recent island adventures. After a few minutes of tinkering, the mechanic slash driver seemed to have gotten things working. He shouted a muffled order to his co-driver, who then ambled back to the front of the bus, another beer in hand, and started the engine. Voila! He was able to MacGyver whatever it was that needed MacGyvering and got the bus fixed. And to be honest, I was both surprised and a little impressed. If it were me, I would have just walked the 150 or so meters to the fatefully located car garage that we had serendipitously broken down near and ask them to deal with it. So kudos to the driver for their initiative and frugalness. With the engine coughing back to life, everyone began to eagerly pile back on the bus. I lingered near the rear just to make sure the engine didn't crap out before I got back to my sweaty, AC-deprived seat. In part, because I didn't want to clamber back on only to have to clamber back off should their tinkering be found lacking. But I was also mildly concerned for the driver still half buried in the engine. Now, fortunately, the engine didn't quit. Unfortunately, something worse happened. The engine chugged an uneven tune as it heated back up. It was steaming and smoking and sizzling. The dark smoke that poured from the tailpipe transformed into a softer shade of toxic gray, the familiar perfume leaking into the breezeless air. I noticed that the rotund man pinned upon that engine was struggling to wiggling himself backward out of the motor trunk. The problem was, and he didn't know this at the time, was that there was an exposed belt spinning rapidly beneath his bare and calloused feet. Those very feet, had he continued to lower them, would have become a mangled mess of broken bones and shredded muscle. No amount of calluses or leathered skin would have saved him from that outcome, and if his hands had gotten tangled in the belt, his fingers would have been removed, or worse. But he didn't know that. He was busy freaking out because he was stuck on a burning hot motor and couldn't wiggle free, cooking alive in the engine oven. The smoke darkened. He started screaming in Thai, a language incomprehensible to me. Screaming in terror, however, is sort of a universal language. I rushed forward before his toes nicked the belt, another young backpacker doing the same. We grabbed the man's legs, keeping his feet away from the belt, keeping our own limbs and digits away from the belt. The heat of the engine made me sweat. It felt like I was standing over an open oven. The driver screamed again, wiggling, wriggling. We did our best to keep his limbs from the spinning belt, supporting his ample weight as he shimmied himself towards us. Propped up on my shoulders, I could smell the stale sweat and warm beer that oozed from his greasy, sooty pores. His legs flailed as he inched towards us, his knees catching me in the chin and chest as we worked to lower him toward the ground. But we struggled to pull him loose. And he in turn struggled to push himself free, our arms wrapped tightly around his legs and waist as we strained to keep him and ourselves from dipping toward the spinning belt and burning metal. He screamed more. The engine seared his skin, seared us both. 
It was roaring a few inches from my face as I bent under his weight. One wrong move and he'd stumble out and my face would press against the spinning belt and the steaming motor, burning and chewing my skin to ribbons. I closed my eyes and pulled, and pulled again. And with help from another traveler, he was out. Back on solid ground, the driver looked terribly relieved. Surprised, but relieved. Now, I don't remember the word for thank you in Thai, but he said it half a dozen times as he struggled to catch his breath. Bracing himself on his knees, he pushed back a thin lank of hair. Droplets of sweat formed on his brow. He knelt there, chest heaving, adrenaline no doubt pumping. After a few moments, he stalked up to the front of the bus to fill in his clueless fellow driver. Leaning against the door, he cracked open a beer and lit up a cigarette. A well-earned reward, to be fair. A young Aussie, decked out in a bright pink muscle shirt and matching sunglasses, gave the man a slap on the shoulder as he boarded. Refreshed and recovered, the driver sucked in the last life from his smoke as he loosened his belt into the realm of comfortable. Tossing the butt into the dirt at his feet, he wiped his greasy hands on a rag before climbing back on board. He gave me a nod as I shuffled back beside him, his shirt stained bloody and black from a few cuts and a whole lot of engine grease. Of course, I happened to be wearing the most expensive shirt I owned. It cost a whole $30. And it too had become stained with his blood and grime. Maybe, just maybe, I'd have to get me one of those muscle shirts after all. So I'm assuming this was true. Yeah. It was true. And, and the funny part is like, it was one of those things that like everyone had already gone back on the bus. So it was just me, some random guy and the driver and my partner. So like nobody knew, like we were like struggling and the guy was screaming, but nobody heard us. Like nobody was paying attention. You know, everyone was just assumed we would be getting off. And so it was kind of like a weird feeling because I got back onto the bus and I'm like, I have blood and like grease on me. And nobody, you know, nobody knew anything. You saved that guy's life. I mean, I, I at least from being from getting, aimed. From, from getting injured. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it, so he was in the, in the engine block while it was running. Yeah. Cause they, he fixed it, yeah. you know, whatever it was. And the other driver went up and started the engine. And so it was running, uh, but he was still like on top. Yeah. And so he's kind of like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it was a big bus, like, right. There's 50 people or something on board. So, and he was like buried in there uh, and he was a heavy guy. Like, I'm not a big guy. You know, I'm 150 pounds on a good day. And he was, you know, probably a good 50, 60, 70 pounds more. Yeah. And so trying to get him out was, but it, you know, it was my favorite shirt. That was my favorite shirt. <laughs> and I had, I had been with me all through Asia for the entirety of the trip. And then, yeah, it didn't, didn't survive. In my old business, I, I had some employees that were from, uh, from Bolivia and they had pictures of like this road like the buses would take and it looked like it's like some buses would go off over the edge i mean it's very mountainous and these roads are like you can barely fit one bus through there i mean it is treacherous i, I believe uh it's called death road yeah uh, and you can pay to bike down it which i almost did i was i was in uh i was nearby uh and my my partner and some and my sister and her fiance we all did like a hike in Peru. Spent a week hiking around Machu Picchu and stuff. And eventually they all left and I stayed because uh, you know I work remotely so I could stay. And so I was I was on the border with Bolivia and I was like looking up like okay it'd be a twenty hour bus ride I could do death row death road and then come back the next day or something. And it, it was just a bit too much of a hassle. But chance of getting in an accident on the bus and then paying to ride down death road it does seem sort of foolish when you when you think about it but yeah i've seen the same pictures and like you can look up gopro footage of people biking down and it's just like a sheer drop yeah see i, I think uh, you have a very good feel for how most people around the world live like i think i think us in the first world i mean I hate to say first world but the west you know people in the west that are you know where we have this uh you know, incredible standard of living compared to most people around the world, it, it becomes almost something where we're just sort of expected. And so you get on a bus without air conditioning and then it's like, oh, well, this is ridiculous. But this is this is the way most of the world lives. And and I've seen it, you know, living in Panama and I've seen, you know, 
kids walking around with no shoes and no shirt. And it's not because it's warm out. It's because they don't have shoes and they don't have a shirt and they live in, there was a place right next to my uh, middle school. It was called, we, it was called Hollywood. And it, and it was basically a bunch of houses, ramshackle houses made from 10 that were just, I mean, it looked like something that you could put up in about a couple hours and it was just piled on. And it was just uh poverty like I've never seen anywhere other than in Panama. And um Yeah, that's this that's one of the things. Cause like you'll you'll go to to countries that are, you know, have a perhaps sort of a lower standard of living and you can do all sorts of amazing things and it's super affordable. Yeah. Uh but you're also confronted by like, you know, all kind like you've got to deal with crime and poverty and and government corruption and stuff like that. So you there's obviously a, a ton of benefits to traveling and I recommend everyone do it. Uh, but one of those benefits is, is seeing that stuff up close because, you know, I, I don't want to say that everyone's life in the West is easy, but relatively speaking, you know, we have a, levels of privilege. And so when you see those hardships, not just on TV, but like with your own eyes, it's, it's incredibly sobering. Um, and it, it, yeah, it really makes you, appreciate what you have more and, and better understand the world around you, I think. Yeah. What's the other thing that's interesting to me is like somebody, and in fact, I was having a conversation with somebody and they were telling me that they were complaining about the, I guess the, you know, the, the rich billionaires that we have in, in the States, people like Jeff Bezos and whatnot. And they're talking about how we need to take this tax money and, and, give to these people that, that need it and, and whatnot. And, and my thought, and, and I knew, and, and I know what this person's job is and they, and they're, they're in here in the States, you know, they're upper middle class maybe, but I'm, I, I told them, I said, look, in the, in the scope of the world, you're in the 1%, you're in the top 0.1%. Maybe you should give all your money to, and so it's really sobering to think about that. Um, so even if you're just in the middle middle class of the United States or in, you know, in, in, in uh, Western Europe, you're still in the top 1% of the world. And I think a lot of people don't get that. Yeah. Oh, totally. I think this was years ago. I read that. Like if you have more than two pairs of shoes, you're yeah. essentially in like the, the, the elite of the world. I, that's why I love traveling. You know, as opposed to taking a vacation, you know, obviously resorts are fun. You're going to cruise. That's one thing. But when you go travel and put yourself into what I call sort of voluntary hardship, you know, these situations where you have to navigate foreign countries and ride uncomfortable dis distances and stuff, um, you know, it is it's a way to grow and, and sort of develop uh, in a way that, you know, I don't think we have that opportunity as often here in the West, you know. Um, which is why, you know, in Europe, it's very common kids before they go to college or university, they take a year off and travel because it, it's, there's sort of a cultural value in that. Um, and we're starting to see it more in Canada and the U S but, um, yeah, I mean, I think if everybody had that opportunity to travel more, you know, we, we realize that we all have way more in common, uh, than we, than we think. Absolutely. One thing that I realized about a lot of the people that I had, because I had a landscaping business, I was in, in, in the you know agrarian sector. And so I hired a lot of guys that were from agrarian backgrounds. And what I found was that literally nobody who was born in America wanted to do the type of work that I, my business did. So all the guys, I was used to hiring guys from Mexico or from Honduras, El Salvador or Bolivia. We had all these guys. One of the things that that just astounded me about them is the unbelievable work ethic. Uh, there was times and we had roughly 30 guys in the field. And I remember at the end of one year, I asked myself this question, do we ever have anybody miss work or be late this whole year? And I went back and kind of checked time cards and stuff. No, not not a single person wow. was sick. Not, I'm sure they were sick. They still came to work. Yeah. You know, not a single person was late. Not a single person uh, didn't show up. And we were working during the busy season, six days a week, working 12 hour days. And there, so it's just, it's just a different, so there's a different mentality. I think when you have this sort of entitlement and I include myself in this, that I have this entitlement that I try to fight against, but it's hard to, when you're so used to things being so easy in comparison to how hard it could be. 
Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we, you know, generally, not everyone, of course, but, you know, for the privileged sort of majority in, in the West, we work, you know, uh, not necessarily for survival on a day to day level. You know, we got bills to pay and got to pay their phone and stuff like that. But we work because we sort of have to. But in, in most of the world, you work to survive. It's like there's you're not working to like, oh, I'm saving up for a trip. It's like, oh, I'm working to pay for the things I need today and tomorrow. And so that, yeah, that work ethic, I've, I've seen it. I was backpacking around the islands in Japan and there are these huge sugar plantations, which, you know, if it was a farm here, you'd have a tractor going up and down harvesting. Yeah. And these guys, the farmers would be out cutting sugar cane with a hand scythe acres of it just acres of it and then their wife or family members would be bundling it up and carrying it like no machinery and like you know i i farmed like i know i've done backbreaking labor but nothing that backbreaking you know like you, you see these videos you've probably seen them you know uh of sort of the migrant workers in the u.s and canada and they're picking fruit at like I picked fruit for 11 years couldn't pick fruit that fast yeah you know? the breakneck it was, speed it's exactly. unbelievable they're just like this with their hands yeah it's because amazing. you know it's it's you know I was I was farming and you know it wasn't subsistence farming my family didn't depend on my income every single day so I could work at like a comfortable pace and yeah you work hard so harder some days but like yeah there's there's definitely a drive in in people who have lived in that sort of subsistence uh lifestyle that we don't have which you know obviously it's sort of a double edged sword right it's like oh that's a great work ethic but they got it from an unfortunate life experience right. and so right. right so that's one of the ways and travel doesn't replicate this 100 percent, but you can sort of put yourself in uncomfortable situations by traveling you know you go out of your comfort zone and do you know a week-long hike or go out backcountry camping or you know travel to some remote island and it's not the same hardship of course but it puts you into uncomfortable challenging situations and that's kind of like the as close as we can get if you're a comfortable Westerner, right? Like you, you put yourself in these new and challenging situations and you do grow and develop. Uh, and maybe there is some hazard is involved, but you know, right. you're not necessarily putting your life or family or well being right. at stake um, significantly. So anyway, yeah. I don't think you can duplicate it entirely. I agree. I think it's helpful to see that stuff. For example, like my employees, when they, they, they had children that were born in the United States and they would, they would often complain to me that they were lazy. They would come up to me and say, oh, you know, they, they complain about their kid. Oh, you know, they don't want to work. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. And it's like, well, they've, they've become Americanized, right? They've, yeah. They've, yeah. they've grown up in the same entitlement that everybody else has. It's, it's almost like, I don't know, it's in a way, it's almost like a superpower that, uh, that these guys are able to, to do this type of work, but it's, it's a hard life. And I think about, you know, you talked about the the fruit pickers and, you know, they wear stuff over their faces because of the chemicals and they're, um, you know, and they're making and they get paid basically by the bushel. And that's why yeah. they're picking like crazy. But, you know, your back's going to be stooped and you, you and I under, have some measure of understanding because we've done farm work, but not obviously not like that, which you mentioned. But I can I can empathize and I can look at it and say, oh, my God, I know what that would be like if I was doing it. I do not want to do it. But, you know, it does make me appreciate any food that I ever buy from the store for sure. It makes me look at it differently. Oh, oh yeah, totally. I mean, you know, it's it's a couple of the stories in my book uh, deal with living at a monastery in Japan oh, wow. for a while. And uh, a lot of our food would be donated. Um, you know, we had a small garden, but we'd get, you know, oh, like bananas at the grocery store were too brown. So we get them and use them. And, uh, I remember we got a box of potatoes that were going bad and there was, you know, like little maggots and worms in some of them. And so an afternoon was spent just like cutting out the parts around the worms, go put the worms in the garden. And then we salvage the potatoes, you know, somebody spills rice. You're like picking up every grain of rice off the floor in part, not to waste it you know, be, because it's a monastery and we're frugal, but, you know, in, in part for this appreciation that like food takes a long time to grow, right? Like it takes months for something to grow and you eat it in a matter of minutes or seconds. So there's kind of this appreciation imbued in everyone that like food is, is valuable. Like this is a lot of time and effort and resources that went into making this. So we should 
sort of ap- appreciate what we have when we yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. The, the amount of food that gets thrown away is absolutely mind boggling. It's, it, it's crazy. Yeah, my, my first job was at a grocery store. I worked there through high school and into university. Um, and it was a great job, like easy sort of job, better than McDonald's, that sort of thing in terms of like, you know, a teenage kind of job, um, you know, because I worked in the produce section. So I was stocking shelves instead of like doing fast flipping burgers, which I, I really enjoyed much better. Um, but the amount of food we would throw out was it was so much that eventually I would uh, take empty boxes, be like, oh, I need to take some empty boxes home you know, cause I'm helping a friend move. And then I just fill it with stuff that was going in the garbage, like bread, cake, fruits, you know, like, Oh, this apple has a bruise garbage. And so every day I just carry this box out and I'd be like, Oh, it's just an empty box. And it would just be full of food that I'd give to like my poor university friends. Cause I'm like, we're throwing out tons, literal tons of this every week. Yeah. And, and that was, doesn't, uh, and that's at the source, almost at the source. But then there's also all the stuff that the people who buy it throw away. Oh, totally. Because I, I go to people's houses and, you know, you see them open their fridge or whatever, and it's just piled with stuff. And yeah. you know that they're, or you go to like a cookout or something and you know that half of this stuff is going to get thrown out. And it's just, in a way, it's kind of, it's heartbreaking to me because as someone, we, we grow probably about half of our food here. Half of the food oh, we nice. eat comes, comes off the land. Um, it used to be a little more because I had, I had chickens and, but they, they got, we started as the forest, the food forest started growing up. We started getting more raccoons and I just couldn't protect them anymore, uh, unfortunately. And I just, I, I could, I, it just, it's heartbreaking to come out and see your chickens dead. They didn't really seem to care about the electric fences, but, but yeah, it's really heartbreaking to, to see the food, uh, to go to waste. And, um, so I'm constantly, I pick, I'm picking up fruit off the ground. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing now that I moved to Sweden is, is like, foraging is like a big part of the culture you know it's a bit more traditional so not like not all the young kids are doing it but like mushrooms berries that's like it's super normal to like you go out in the summer people have their own spots they won't like tell you where they go and they forage for mushrooms and berries um and stuff like that and i think that's a great a great sort of cultural sort of um tradition to have because it does connect you more with the land and the food that you're eating and i it makes you appreciate it more. If you know what goes into picking a bunch of berries and having to wash them and then freeze them and stuff like that, yeah, you sort of abs- you, you develop a greater appreciation. Then you're not going to waste them, right? Yeah, we do. We do a lot of uh, sort of like uh, wild foraging where we're we'll eat certain weeds. That chickweed is one that I like for salads. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of different quote unquote weeds. Even oxalis, I kind of like the lemony flavor. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that just grows that I'll pick, you know, especially in the earlier spring when we're, you know, when, when we need, uh, when you get some of the succulent lettuces and stuff, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah oh, there's so oh, much, sure. there's so much on the land that's, that's edible that people have no idea that you can eat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we're, we're starting to see more of like an appreciation or a trend towards getting back to sort of more responsible sort of both farming, but also just like consuming food in general, people are starting to realize that like, uh, you know, what you eat does really matter. Uh, and it is impacting the climate and, and job security and all of that. So I hope that continues and more people get involved in things like community gardens or uh, CSA, stuff like that. Cause yeah, it's, it's, you learn, a, once you start to think about what you eat and where it comes from, uh, it, it's eye opening. Yeah, absolutely. It is absolutely eye opening. Well, Chris, hey, thank you so much for the story. It was great. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Where can people find your work? Yeah, so you can find uh, all my stuff's on Amazon. All three of my books, uh, The Dogs of Nam, which is a much more lighthearted series of travel stories. But if you want something more violent, brutal, gritty, then my dystopian uh, soon to be trilogy, The Less Year, uh, is is where you want to check that out. Um, you can also find me on ckoldfield.com. And CK Oldfield on social media, Facebook, Instagram, even TikTok, you know, so. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share. We'll see you uh, next week on Thriller Ball.